May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, as mentioned before, is the Old Testament lesson read earlier. Let us read it again from Isaiah 29, verses 18 and 19, where we read as follows that portion of God's Word, which will be the sermon text. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. So far the text. In the name of Jesus who opens the eyes of the spiritually blind, opens the ears of the spiritually deaf, and makes the tongue of the spiritually dumb to speak. Dear fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true and only living, creating and preserving triune God. If you looked around at the world we live in lately, our society and our culture, well, what do you see? What do you see out there? First of all, let's talk about the family. Now, the family was designed by God as the basic building block of all life in this world, all culture, all society. It's how new people were designed to come into this creation. And so the Bible says God created them male and female. And from these, when they came together, they would become one. And you see that in their children. Equally, the male and the female make the new person, that one person. To illustrate the oneness of marriage, this was God's plan. The family, mother, father, children, grandparents, grandchildren, Do we see that in our society today? We see it rotting. The very foundation stones of society crumbling. Because marriage, which is the basis of family, is also becoming completely destroyed. What do we see? study was done not too long ago of married couples in the United States. This study concluded that one half of all marriages today are unhappy. One fourth are critically unhappy. Twenty percent are in name only where the husband and wife live totally separate lives. What do we attribute this to? Why does this happen? Well, I'll say it in two words. Playboy philosophy. That has completely inundated our culture. That sex is not for marriage and family and children. It's for play. And therefore, extramarital relations, sexual relations, are not only acceptable, they're good. And of course, premarital relations the same way. No wonder then we see divorce on every hand. We see marriage rates actually declining now. The number of illegitimate births skyrocketing. I know my wife, when we first got married, uh, was a nurse. And her first job in a hospital while I was in the seminary was in the OB department. 
the babies are born. This is uh, 1971. And the number of illegitimate births was almost negligible, minuscule. Ask Lynn about it someday. Today, over half of the births in hospitals are outside of marriage. Just in my lifetime. Family, marriage, rotting. Homosexuality on the rise. What the Bible calls an abomination of God's plan of marriage. Pornography, literally a billion dollar business on the internet. All of this leads, of course, to sexually transmitted diseases, which have now reached epidemic proportions in our society. What else do we see out there in our society, in our culture? Alcoholism. Do you know alcoholism in our country today is the third leading cause of death? Third leading cause of health problems? First two causes, by the way, are heart disease and cancer. Drug addiction. Rampant. It is considered the greatest source of crime in our country. Two thirds of the criminals in our country and prisons are drug addicts. The United States consumes 60% of the world's production of illegal drugs. 30% of college students today use cocaine. What else do we see out there in our society? Gambling. It used to be just in Las Vegas. That's everywhere. Everywhere in our country. Legitimized stealing is all it is. How can I get something from somebody else for nothing? Doing nothing for them. And then you got the whole issue of abortion. Just, it's just sad, just plain sad what we see there. It's a holocaust. Worse than anything the Nazis ever did. Far exceeding the numbers of the Nazis. Dishonesty, shoplifting, embezzlement, astrology, and go on and on and on when we look at the United States. And it's not a whole lot different anywhere else in the world. And yet, in the midst of this, only half of all the Americans who were surveyed can name even one of the four Gospels in the Bible. Half can't name any of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. You add it all up. What does this say? This is what God, Jesus, the Bible calls darkness. Darkness. It's like people can't see the, the hand in front of their face. It is so spiritually dark. They don't know where they're going. They don't have any idea of what they're doing. The damage that they're doing to themselves now and eternally and to those around them. A lot of people are afraid of the dark. This is a darkness to really be afraid of. And Isaiah, in this text before us today, refers to it. Even though this was 700 B.C., 
he saw it in his day in Israel. And he was speaking to his day, and he is speaking to the time that the Messiah would come, and he's speaking to our day. No difference. He says, blind, deaf, obscurity, darkness. And in verse 19, he also adds, poor. All of these describe our society today spiritually. If you read elsewhere in Isaiah, uh, he also described, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Jerusalem in his day, Sodom. That's what he called it, Sodom and Gomorrah. And I think that's what our society today has become, Sodom and Gomorrah. Billy Graham said, uh, if God doesn't bring judgment upon our nation soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for what he did to them. A lot of similarities between Israel's day when Isaiah prophesied to them and Sodom and Gomorrah, and also to the United States, our society today. So Isaiah's message to us is just as important, just as relevant today as it was in his day. And what was his message? What is the message of the book of Isaiah? What was God saying to us through the prophet Isaiah? He was saying basically this. We have a problem. God has a plan. Let's look at those two things. First of all, what is our problem? We have a problem. Well, we just talked about our problem. We talked about the symptoms, but the real problem is deaf, Blind, obscure, dark. That's our problem. And this problem is a spiritual problem that relates to God. We have a God problem. When you boil it all down, that's where it's at. A problem with God. What is our problem with God? Our problem with God is he's there and we are here. Big separation. Big separation beyond what most people can even comprehend between God and man. Not just that God is almighty, all-powerful and all-knowing and so forth, but the bigger separation is God is Holy! We are unholy. That's our problem. What does it mean when the Bible says that God is holy? And by the way, you'll notice, what does uh, Isaiah call God in this text? Well, you look at it for a minute, and let me tell you something. When God called Isaiah to be his prophet to Israel and to us, for we're reading his inspired work today. When God called Isaiah, Isaiah wrote about it in his book. He said, one day God showed me a vision of God. And it was as of a man sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple he was in, and flying over uh, him were all kinds of angels, Isaiah said. And these angels were crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. He is holy. What does that mean? That means he cannot sin. He has never sinned. He will never sin. He cannot stand sin. He cannot be in the presence of sin. Isaiah, when he saw this vision of God, even though it looked like one man, they were saying holy three times. 
There's your trinity, three and one. When he saw this vision of God, Isaiah said, I, I said, woe is me. Woe is me. I am lost. When people see God, when they really see the true God, that's their reaction. Anyone. Why? Why do we immediately think we're lost? Isaiah went on to explain. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. But my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. He thought that because he had seen God, he was going to die forever. But he hadn't really seen God. He'd seen a vision of God. No man, the Bible says, can see God and live. But he'd seen a vision of God. But just seeing this vision of God and seeing how holy and perfect and sinless he was immediately made Isaiah feel very, very sinful, very separated from God. Well, he's, he's perfect. And by comparison, I'm so sinful. I'm so unclean. That's our problem. That's the problem that we have, spiritual problem, that we are unclean, that we are like blind. We, we, we're in the dark. And not only that, we are deaf because we don't hear, as it says in our text, the words of the book. The book, of course, means the book of God that he would write. We call it the Bible. Like I said, half the Americans can't even list one of the four Gospels, let alone the other 66 books of the Bible. We're blind. We're deaf. We are separated from God. And we don't even know it. Because we can't see and we don't hear. So what is the answer to the question? What did you find in the text? What does God, what does Isaiah refer to God as? The Holy One of Israel. From that moment on, from when he saw that vision of God, that's the word that's stuck in his mind about God. Above all the other attributes of God, he is holy. He simply cannot dwell in the, in the presence of a single sin. Absolute, perfect perfection. The Holy One of Israel. And that's our problem that leads to all these other symptoms. That we are separated from God, our Creator, the one who made us. We're living so unlike Him, like He, he planned us to be, like Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. When they had the image of God, we've lost that image of God. That's our problem. But the other message of Isaiah is God thankfully, mercifully, graciously, lovingly has a plan. Instead of simply writing us off and saying, you're, you're so sinful, you're so unclean, you're so unholy, get out of my presence forever. He said, no, I the holy, perfect, sinless God 
who can't abide in the presence of sin. I'll do the unthinkable. I'll come down to that sinful world and I'll live in it as a, as a man. Of course, a sinless man. But I'll touch the unclean thing. I'll live in the midst of those sinners. I'll eat with them. I'll live with them. And I will then take upon them the unthinkable. I will, I'll, I'll take upon myself the unthinkable. I'll take all of their uncleanness, all of their unholiness into my holiness. That's the only way. That's the only way. Without this, they're gone. They're doomed to always be separate from God in heaven. But I will, the holy God, take their unholiness, and, and I will die for it. I will be forsaken of God for it myself, and I will give them in place of it my holiness. I will make them holy, fit to be in my presence to live with me forever. That is God's plan. Isaiah, in just these two verses, speaks of it. In that day, when God, the Holy One, comes to this world and touches the unholiness, in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall, be, shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek, those who admit their, their problem, also shall increase their joy in the Lord. And the poor, those who realize that they're poor, not just economically, but before God, they're poor in terms of holiness, shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. That's God's plan. Now, Isaiah, as he brought this message from God, we say that he was prophesying the coming of the Messiah. Okay? But it was much more than just that word, Messiah. And when he talked about him opening the eyes and the ears it was more than just, as we read in the gospel lesson, the physical eyes and the physical ears. That was the outward sign that this was the Messiah. But it was much more important than that because we're all deaf and we're all blind. To see God, our creator, and to hear his word. And the Messiah would deliver us from that Blindness and that darkness and that obscurity and that deafness and that ignorance of God. So Jesus did this, as Isaiah foretold. The Messiah did this. He did it literally and he did it spiritually. I'm going to read to you a few other verses from Isaiah. Talked about this coming of the holy God into an unholy world. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light shined. Again, Isaiah said that this Messiah would do this. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So God spoke through Isaiah. Well, that's God's plan. But God also told Isaiah be prepared. Because most people will not listen to you. 
Most people, even though God wants them to hear the words of the book, they will not listen, or when they listen, they will reject it. In other words, they will not believe it. Because most people don't want to confess they have a problem. Or at least, if they have a problem, the problem isn't with God that that's the basis of all the problems in their life and in society. They just won't admit it, that they have such a big problem. I'm unholy, and God is holy, and we're so far separated. Most people won't believe it. Most people think, well, if I have a problem, it's a little problem, and I can solve it myself. Or if I can't solve it, there's some other human being somewhere who can solve it for me. And so they turn to themselves, or they turn to other people to solve their little problem. Isaiah also spoke of this, if you read his whole book. Under the inspiration of a God, God spoke through Isaiah saying, most people will only hear, and this is the exact words, smooth things. In other words, good things about them, flattering things. Most people want to be told that their problems are small and are easily solved by themselves or other people. Most people want to think pleasing things and hear pleasing things, what Isaiah called smooth things. They want their prophets to tell them, you aren't so bad. There's a little bit of good in everybody, and there's a lot of good in you. They want to hear well, I'm not great. I'm not a super good person. I'm not spiritually rich. But at the same time, I'm not bad either. I'm not spiritually poor. I'm kind of spiritually middle class. That's what they want to hear. God warned Isaiah. You bring them this message that they are deaf and blind and poor, most people won't want to hear it because back in those days especially if you were deaf and blind and poor you were a beggar along the side of the road you were the dregs of society and uh, people don't want to hear that that's what they are to God it's the same today But God came in his great mercy, did the unthinkable, the impossible. And he healed the blind beggar and the deaf beggar. Some people will believe it. Some will be healed. Some will have their eyes open and they'll see out of obscurity, out of all this mass of sin, They'll see the light that is God in Jesus Christ. Their eyes will be opened. Their ears will be opened to the words of the book. And they will rejoice. They will joy in the Lord. And that's faith. They will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. That's faith. Faith is the opposite of self-help. It's being meek and confessing that we're poor and we can't help ourselves any more than that blind beggar by the roadside. So we don't put faith in ourselves to solve our problems. We put it in the Holy One of Israel. And we rejoice that he has saved us sinners. Well, that was true in Isaiah's day. Most people didn't listen to Isaiah in Jerusalem and Judea. But it's also true today. Most people today, well, Life Magazine many years ago put it th this way. Whereas our forefathers consulted their pastors seeking salvation in God,
God, our age has consulted chiefly economists seeking salvation in prosperity, which incidentally we failed to achieve. This is anti-faith. This is the opposite of faith. This is saying, you have a problem? Man has a plan. Many people today illustrate this with the fact that they like politicians who want to make the government programs bigger and bigger and bigger. They think, well, government has the plan. Government has the answer. Government is so big, it can solve any problem that we've got. And so they vote more and more power to government. But look at the results. Government is proving how powerless it is. We make more and more laws, millions and millions of laws. We put more and more people in prison. But what's the result? Crime increases. It's not the answer. Because they've misdiagnosed the problem. We spend more and more money on education. That's the answer. That's the plan of man. Just spend more money on it. But as education has more money spent on it, illiteracy grows and immorality grows. We've spent trillions of dollars on the so-called war on poverty, but poverty has increased. Something much more than man is needed. Something much more than government is needed. Isaiah also wrote, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Again, Isaiah, under the inspiration of God, wrote, their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. We have a problem. God has a plan. Man has a plan. Totally different plans. God's plan is in Christ Jesus. Not in man at all. Anyone not following God's plan will be eternally separated from God. Will never see God in heaven. God's plan in Christ Jesus is the only one that will work. Because it alone deals with the real problem. It restores us to holiness through our Creator because our Creator paid for all of our sins. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.